Okay, this is actually really paired really well with um, Stephen's presentation. Can everyone hear me? No. To speak? No? Okay. Maybe I'll put it quick. Is that better? Yes. All right. Um, so in this presentation, I'm also mainly speaking about listening. Uh, so insofar as this is a conference on the sonic and the occult, uh, I'm mainly focusing on the space of receptivity. Uh, and a space of listening, particularly listening to the dead. So the dead are always figured as those, they say, who never return. They are in between, on the way, yet never present. I wanted to know what happens, though, when we start to see the dead not as over there, but as right here. If death is rather a saccade, a brink, who exists in this place, and what are the possibilities of articulation? So everyone here is versed on Sylvia Winter. I had this huge blurb where I unpacked some things that I crossed out, because you all seem way ahead of me. Um, but if there are some terms, I can unpack them after the presentation. Cultural theorist and writer Sylvia Winter drops what I see as a challenge. In an interview with Catherine McKittrick, Winter says, we must now collectively undertake a rewriting of knowledge as we know it. If we continue with our old way of thinking, we drift as a species toward an unparalleled catastrophe. Winter pauses that the way out of the catastrophic legacy of secular humanism is to disintegrate the naturalization of homo economicus, I can unpack that later, or who she terms man too, uh, by realizing that the human is a hybrid being, who she calls homo nerens, both bios and mythoi an idea taken from Franz Fanon, where bios aligns with skin and mythoi with masks. I believe that communication with the dead is a method that unwrites epic narratives of metaphysics and secular humanism in being exactly those who are not natural, those who are extra natural, supernatural. The dead are my limit case for what winter terms are now purely naturalized modes or genres of humanness. Instead of engaging in Winter's call for a rewriting of knowledge, however, I'm choosing the word unwriting instead. And I found this actually in a 1984 essay by Winter, where she says that before we can rewrite the knowledge, we first must unwrite normative subject uh, positionings. I've chosen the positioning of villains, ghosts, and roses, all of which represent a certain cohesiveness of mythoi and bios as a way of speaking of and through communication with the dead. Even still, the invitation to speak with ghosts may seem like a stretch within a post-natural sciences, post-psychoanalytic episteme, whereas Winter writes the liberal subject works within a de-supernaturalized order of consciousness. Uh, <coughs> consciousness. We always speak of the dead as, like, say, an aspect of self or an aspect of speaking with different uh, forms of consciousness. However, it is precisely the work of defamiliarization and discomfort that I believe ghosts can accomplish in the present moment. And I mean, I'm really speaking of ghosts as other beings, not as another aspect of my consciousness. The gesture of unwriting for me has to do with defamiliarizing. This is a video I took of myself practicing automatic writing, which is a form of channeling. Uh, and automatic writing, I would say, is a good example of what I mean by unwriting. Uh, in this case, it's also a practice that I use to communicate with uh, or attune to ghosts. So to situate my knowledge, I'm an academic, also a practicing witch. Uh, I took an initiation specifically to practice mediumship, which is sort of my witch specialty. Um, and I work with various covens where I live in Montreal. I also try to integrate this into my scholarship and see where they intersect. Uh, so before I begin to speak about ghosts, I want to speak briefly about life. Uh, life, uh, death, rather, to anthropologist Elizabeth Pavanelli is included within the category of life in her equation uh, noted above. Interestingly, surrealist artist Uni Katsuin, who had a practice of automatic drawing, uh, had a similar definition as Pavanelli, so not just having life death, but having sort of a third factor. I thought this was really fascinating uh, in their work. So where six is death, nine is life, and the two are contained in the hidden images is the number eight. So for Pavanelli, a rock may be considered non-life, but I'm not sure that this is what Zurin means. Um, it's something more secret, more folded. 
So this eight, which is both an aspect of death and life, seems to me to be present in Claire Colbrook's essay on not becoming man. Uh, so in short, Colbrook, uh, she's definitely a Deleuzian, but she's very uncomfortable with the term becoming, and she's really critical of it. Uh, she sees it as sort of um, an always productive action that she wants to overturn, and that she sees remaining within a norm of life in which action, production, dynamism, and being are privileged over unactualized potential. These values to Kohlberg are associated with man. Uh, and a criticism liberated from the concept of man would acknowledge, this is a quote from Kohlberg, would acknowledge that fragile materialization of a work that resists comprehension, inclusion, recognition, and interpretation. It is precisely this refusal of matter to be itself that communication with the dead accomplishes, I believe. And speaking of life and death, I'm aligning more with the folding than the becoming, more with the nocturnal than the diurnal, a space that does not extend toward comprehension necessarily, but resides in the impossible or unactualized, not a becoming, but an unbecoming, perhaps. If ghosts are the subject I'm addressing here, then villains are the adepts who communicate with ghosts, and roses are where ghosts are housed. All academic ghost stories begin at Jacques Derrida's 1993 Spectres of Marx. <laughs> and though Derrida opened the field of hauntology and instigated uh, what is called the spectral turn, there has been little reckoning of ghosts as ontological possibilities rather than as metaphors or projections within critical theory. It might just be because these two things just don't match up. Uh, Yves Tech and C. Rees' 2013 essay, Glossary of Haunting, comes close to questioning the function of haunting or spectrality. They could be seen uh, as aligning with Sylvia Winter in writing The Innocence out of Homo Economicus, a figure who has monopolized thoughts, people, lands, and also myths. Erasure and defacement concoct ghosts, tuck and rewrite. I don't want to haunt you, but I will. The ghost who rises up from erasure and defacement is a ghost who demands an adjustment of attention in order to be heard. To demonstrate this, Tuck and Reed turn to the horror genre. In contrast to the typical American horror movie, where the hero is preoccupied throughout the film with righting wrongs, slaying monsters, burying the undead, all acts as Tuck and Reed assert of containment. The Japanese horror genre is all about revenge. Rather than spectral containment, they write, spectral dissemination. For Tuck and Reed, the ghost is that who leaks past containers who asserts it is not going away, despite its wish to be gone. Uh, this is an installation by Tuck and Ree where they're using actual leakage. They're fascinated with this concept of the leak. So the opposite of containment as a kind of slight but gnawing discomfort and presence of instability. And I thought it was better to show something like this than like a picture of a ghost. <laughs> um, this also reminded me, this sort of focus on leaking reminded me of Lucretius who noted that the vital spirit leaks out of the body in triplets. In Tuck and Reed's figuration, haunting becomes the relentless remembering and reminding that will not be appeased by settler society's assurances of innocence and reconciliation. Alien to settlers and generative for ghosts, this refusal to stop is its own form of resolving. But I would argue that Tuck and Reed are still using ghosts as a metaphor, much like hauntology does. They offer a sense of the ghost as an unsettling and unsettled presence. Winter quotes biologist Humberto Maturana, and knowing that only when we listen can we start to change. One began to listen and one's language began to change, says Maturana. But then, only then, new things could be said. The ones who have traditionally been able to listen to the dead have also traditionally been characterized as villains. From roughly the 1580s to the 1630s, around 40,000 to 60,000 accused witches were legally put to death across Europe under the suspicion they were an actual communication with Satan, one that was very much not one-sided or hermeneutic. In her book, Caliban and the Witch, Sylvia Federici notes, so it is no coincidence that the most infamous witch hunting manual, the Malaeus Maleficarum, was written in 1496 on the eve of Columbus's voyage. For Federici, the genocide of witches in Europe is imbricated with the genocide of indigenous populations in the so-called New World, with the symbolic life-death narratives of wealth and poverty, and with the beginnings of the transatlantic slave trade. Among other talents of divination, healing, and ritual, 
The witch and her cohorts are those who are comfortable with speaking into a time out of joint as Derrida characterizes ghosts and specters with marks. It is interesting that mythological figures who have traditionally been seen in a negative light, like the witch, stand at the threshold between life and death and are able to communicate with this threshold. This is true as well for the Gorgons and the Morai. You could look into multiple different villains who are associated with death um, and the way that they challenge the scenes between life and death. They are, like Tuck and Reed's hauntings, difficult figures to meet. In describing the process of automatic writing with his wife Georgie Hyde Lee's poet W.B. Yeats noted that sometimes if I stopped writing and drew one hand over another, my hand smelt of violets or roses. Sometimes the truth I sought would come to me in a dream. If, if the ghost is who this tale is about and the villain is who is attuned to the tale, then the rose is where the tale occurs. It may have seemed more logical to pick a structure like a haunted house. Um, <laughs> to locate the ghost, but roses, it seems to me, are more secretive. More so than the other categories presented here, the rose is undeniably part of the world of unmediated bios. To conjure the rose in words is still to inhale the sharp, fresh signature of its petals, to feel the carefulness of fingers working amongst the thorns of its protected stem. Yet the rose gives the natural world away. It is often said that ghosts are a type of presence, one that is felt. The rose is not quite a presence in the same way that a ghost is, yet it is both present and presencing. Like the witch, the rose works with spells of protection. In variations of the tale Sleeping Beauty, thorns are portrayed as covering the walls of the spellbound sleepers in the castle, occulting their slumber to the realm of near death. When we imagine roses, it is probably an image of a red rose that comes to mind, but I'd like to focus on a rose of a different kind, one that is less iconic and epic, and exists more in the world of mythoi than bios. Of all roses, it is the blue rose who is the most boundary crossing. If there are any Twin Peaks fans here, yeah. yes, <laughs> you'll know a little bit about the blue rose. Um, the blue rose is associated with Mary Magdalene. I mean, it's associated with all kinds of things that I can't get into right now, but it's sort of, and it's also associated with the Holy Grail. It's sort of the ultimate and the evasive. Um, the attempt to create a blue rose in nature has also seemed an endeavor both occulted and impossible, similar to the attempt of alchemists to create gold from metal. So far, it has mostly involved dying white roses. The Suntory Global Innovation Center in Japan, this is one of their blue roses, has claimed to have produced a blue rose through biotechnologies of isolating blue genes from petunias, though their rose appears more of an eerie violet to me than a blue. Suntory, who also conducts studies on the experience of the taste of water, write on their website how the blue rose has signified the impossible, a non-existent object, because nobody could produce blue roses. In its knack of tying together the mystical and the biological, the blue rose also brings us into the realm of bio-art, where artists such as Aggie Hines are telling different kinds of ghost stories. In her ongoing work, Sacramental Antibiotics, Heinz proposes to develop antibiotics using corpses of religious figures, principally with molecules found in catacombs and ossuaries. In this way, perhaps a ghost is similar to a molecule, part of the hybridity of the human, or at least the refrain that hangs between or beyond the assemblage of a human and the assemblages of the out-of-body. The striving toward the blue rose presents the connection between impossibility, that Stephen was also talking about, and an obligation toward that impossibility. In Novalis' 1802 novel, Heinrich von Offerdingen, the main character is obsessed by a blue-colored flower. I yearn to get a glimpse of the blue flower, he writes. It is perpetually in my mind. It seems as if I had a dream. For in the world where I had always lived, who ever bothered about flowers? Establishing a scholarly connection with the dead is for me an offering to the dead, concurrently as it is an offering to my work as a scholar. It is one that doesn't leave the worlds of the dead out of the scholarly gaze, and one that also acknowledges this gaze must adjust accordingly. This is a little Instagram story I put together um, of a research witch hut that I had at the Banff Center of the Arts in Banff, Alberta, in which I dearly miss. Uh, by unwriting our seemingly most natural tropes and genres, protagonists and antagonists, we can unearth the solidity of the natural they are embedded in and importantly, the axes and values that those narratives are meant to uphold. 
At the same time, I would say that in doing so, we also have to be careful of the terms I have been dropping throughout, such as attuning, recognizing, paying attention. These acts of shifting awareness must be precisely intoned, lest they become harmful rather than healing. We must know that what we are attuning to or paying attention to is not merely another echo of a dominant, internalized, naturalized narrative, or as Glenn Coltard puts it, master-sanctioned forms of recognition. This is similar to how Zakia Iman Jackson cautions against a non-locatable uh, beyond, where a Eurocentric transcendentalism is simply assumed. How to write about ghosts within a post-human, inhuman, counter-human era is not to connect necessarily to the radical alterity of the post-subject, but somehow the opposite. And that is more difficult and probably less desirable for it presents an entire reworking of positioning, particularly away from a reliance on the psyche to make sense of what leaks past the psyche or exceeds the psyche to begin with. For it is not the closedness of death or the dead that riles the hero and makes him jump, but the utter openness, the void that never ceases, the agape. This too is the desire. This has to do with listening and attuning, I've noted, as I've noted. But even here, that's not exactly it. How to know ghosts is not to learn how to listen. How to know ghosts is to learn how they listen. Thanks.